Well, aloha everyone, and welcome to our lecture on tissue organization for anatomy and physiology one here at Chaminade University. The overview of this chapter is that we're going to talk about the different types of tissue and their origins. We'll talk about how tissues are held together, so how are the cells actually connected to the other cells. And then we'll discuss epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue, and then we'll compare them and contrast them to show you all of the ways that they are the same, and then of course ways that they are different. And we'll talk a little bit more about membranes, which I know we talked about previously, a little bit more about their structure and the function of the membranes, and then also talking about tissue repair and regeneration at the end of this chapter. The four major tissue types are epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. We'll talk about each of those independently, but let's talk about how cells are held together first. So how cells are held together by junctions, right? And basically it's any time that we have a point of contact between one cell and another that's called a cell junction. And we have a couple different types of junctions. So this here is an adhesion belt, which is going to be more like a Ziploc bag, right? It's a much longer series of adhesions. Uh, but we can also have these little things which are more like snaps, right? Things like desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Now, Tight junctions are going to keep water from going across, right? They're going to be watertight. And this is going to be very important in areas like your bladder, for example. Um, and you can picture this along the lines of a vacuum sealer, right? You're going to have a bunch of little teeny tiny dots that are going to hold the cells from one um, cell to another cell by these little teeny tiny plasma membrane proteins. Then we'll have pockets of the intracellular space here, um, but these transmembrane proteins are going to make it so that these are watertight. And that's an example of tight junctions. Again, these are found anywhere that you have to hold liquid, and a bladder is a very good example. Adherence, junc adherence junctions are what we just talked about with that adhesion belt. It's more like the top of a Ziploc bag. When we have the two plasma membranes next to each other, and then we have this specialized uh, actin layer, which forms this long plaque. And along there we have these transmembrane proteins. These are called cadherins, and the cadherins are going to stick out of one membrane and out of the other membrane, and they're going to form kind of like a, like a zipper in between that's going to hold together this adhesion belt. And that's called an adherence junction. Now, desmosomes are kind of like snaps. So they're going to be regions where we still have that cadherin, right, which is going to be our adhesion, but instead of having that long belt, we're just going to have a little dot of it, whereby one part, one cell is going to connect to the other cell by way of these cadherins, which again are transmembranes, so they're going to go all the way across, um, and then they're going to connect into these plaques, which are then going to connect into the cytoskeleton directly by the keratin, which is the intermediate filament. That's called a desmosome. We also have what's called a hemidesmosome, which is basically just one half of that. So this is when we're going to connect to something like a basement membrane. When we talk about organization of cells, you'll note that we often orient ourselves by trying to locate the basement membrane and then figure out where cells are adhered to or their structure or surrounding the basement membrane. So if we are connecting instead of from one cell to another, we're connecting from a cell to a basement membrane. We'd have what's called a hemidesmosome, which would be half of that snap. Again, internal of the cell, we would have that scaffolding, the intermediate filament, which is connected to the plaque, which would be connected um, directly to an integrin. So instead of having the cadherins, we're going to have the integrins, and they're going to connect directly to that transmembrane glycoprotein here in that extracellular space. Um, and again, that's called a, a hemidesmosome. Now gap junctions are going to be similar in shape to the hemidesmosomes and the desmosomes in that they look kind of like a snap, right? They're a little circle. Um, but they're going to actually allow for passage of information. So relay and communication is going to be allowed through gap junctions. This is kind of like the equivalent of having a tin can on a string connected to your neighbor. Um, they are going to be connected by connexons, which are made of the protein connexin, and it makes these long porous kind of channels, which are going to allow information to be passed from one cell to the next directly without having to go into this gap in the extracellular space. Now, we'll be looking at epithelial tissue and connective tissue and nervous tissue and muscle tissue, but let's just take a look at epithelial and connective tissue now and make some pretty obvious generalizations. So some of the first differences that you can see is that we have small cells in epithelial tissue. Many cells packed together tightly. There's very little extracellular matrix, and they seem to have a little bit more of an organized complexity. In connective tissue, we have much larger cells. They're scattered out kind of randomly almost, and they're surrounded by large amounts of extracellular matrix and extracellular matrix molecules. In fact, these nuclei don't even look to be the same size, um, and that's because they're going to actually be larger, right? So epithelial tissue and connective tissue are pretty much easily distinguishable on the spot. Um, and then when we talk more about epithelial tissue, we'll talk about the different types of epithelial tissue, which is oftentimes where students will get hung up.
So let's talk about epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissue is when cells are arranged in these nice little layered sheets, generally on top of a plasma membrane. They're densely packed together and have these specific cell junctions that connect them to each other. Again, they're attached on top of a basement membrane, which again, if we're looking under a microscope, is how we're going to orient ourselves. And the epithelial tissue is avascular. So what does that mean? It means it does not have vasculature. So there's no blood supply, um, but it does have a, nervous to, a nerve supply to it as well. So it's going to be fed basically from the surrounding fluid. So the, um, the fluid, this extracellular fluid, is going to have nutrients that are going to end up coming into the cells directly. So we're not going to end up with any vasculature or blood supply directly. They're also going to undergo frequent mitotic events. This is cells that are going to be constantly undergoing wear and, and tear and ending up having to repair themselves. So this is a diagram that you're going to see a couple different times when we talk about the different types of epithelial cells. So epithelial cells are going to be found on top of this basement membrane. And the basement membrane is comprised of a basal lamina and a reticular lamina. But basically, if you see the word lamina, you know you're dealing with a basement membrane. And a basement membrane is going to separate one type of tissue from another, in this case, the epithelial tissue from the connective tissue down here. And the connective tissue is going to be vascularized, so it's showing the blood vessel and the blood going through it. Remember, the epithelial tissue is avascular, um, but this shown in yellow is nerves. And we're going to try to, you're going to see the same coloration throughout the entire semester, depicting blood vessels and um, blood cells in red. Uh, epithelial tissue will have pink cells and the purple nuclei. Nervous tissue is always generally going to be shown as yellow. So it'll help kind of, you'll start to recognize these major features as we work our way through. Um, another thing to talk about is the apical surface versus the lateral surface. So when we're talking apical, that's going to be the surface that's going to be free. It's going to be touching the, what we call the lumen or the center inside um, whatever the organ system is. And the lateral surface is going to be a region that's going to touch the cells next to each other. The basal surface, obviously, is going to be the region that's touching the basement membrane. And so that's how these um, epithelial cells are going to be oriented in what we call an epithelium or also an epithelial sheet, you may hear, hear it referred to. And there are multiple different types of epithelial tissue. And there's multiple ways of classifying them. We classify them according to the shape of the cells and also how many layers thick they have. Or how many layers thick they are, I apologize. So if they're arranged into a single layer, then that's going to be a simple epithelial tissue. Right? If they're, this is called pseudostratified because it is a single layer, but because the nuclei are kind of all over the place, it appears to be stratified at first glance. And what does stratified mean? Stratified means that we have multiple layers of the tissue. So pseudostratified might appear to be stratified at the glance if you were to just look at where the nuclei were placed, but if you start to look at where the cells are placed, you'll see they are actually one layer thick. It's just they're much, much longer. Um, so again, we have simple one layer, stratified multilayer, pseudostratified looks like multiple layers, but it's truly only one layer in fact. We also can look at the cell shape. So if the shells look really, cells, sorry, if the cells look really flat and amorphous, they're going to be squamous cells. Um, this is cuboidal cells, which kind of explains itself. They look like little um, cubes, right? Little pans of bread. Um, but we also have a, here the columnar, which is going to be arranged kind of in long columns, right? And so we're going to discuss whether they are simple pseudostratified or stratified, as well as where the, whether they are squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. And so when we go through um, for the lab, we're going to have a histology section, and you're going to be looking at different types of epithelial tissue. And so these are the things you're going to want to keep in mind when you're classifying the cells underneath the microscope. So all the different types of stratified epithelial tissue are going to basically depend on the shape of the apical cells um, and the size and the way that they're, well, the shape and the size, right? Um, these are the combinations that are possible. So for pseudostratified, it can only be columnar. So let me go back a second. Pseudostratified, again, is going to look like it's stratified, perhaps, at the first glance, if you were only looking at where the nuclei were located. But if you were looking at the actual cells themselves, you will see we will only have one cell layer deep. This is all one cell layer thick. It's just a long cell layer, whereas this is multiple cell layers thick. Even though it's the same height, we have multiple cell layers. And that's the difference between stratified and pseudostratified. Um, and as you, can men as you can see, pseudostratified can only be columnar, because that's when it starts to get tricky, is whether or not um, it's going to be looking like it is um, very long and therefore it's columnar, but it can also have the nuclei in multiple locations. So if all the nuclei are at the bottom, then it's going to appear more obvious that it's a simple 
but if it's pseudostratified because all the nuclei are in different locations throughout there, it might be a little bit more complicated. Again, the naming options are for simple, we can have squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. Again, for simple, that looks like this, simple squamous, simple cuboidal, and simple columnar. And then for pseudostratified, again, we can only have columnar. For stratified, we can also have squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. So we have multiple layers of squamous tissue, multiple layers of cuboidal tissue, and multiple layers of columnar cells in the tissue. All right, um, let's talk about glands for a second. Glands are going to get their own, um, well, secretion of different hormones are going to get their own chapter next semester, but let's talk about glands and their structure for just a moment. Um, we have endocrine glands, glands and exocrine glands. And the difference is their method of secretion, right? Um, so endocrine glands are, glands are going to secrete into the blood vessels that are surrounded. It's going to get picked up and traveled through the bloodstream. And an exocrine gl gland is going to have a secretion where it's going to actually have secretory cells that are going to secrete it out. In this case, for example, a sweat gland. It's going to get secreted out instead of going into the bloodstream. Let's go back to the morphology for a second. So this here is a the thyroid gland. And if we take a look at it in a cross section under a light microscope, we see these regions that are follicles. Okay, this entire region, including these external cells, which are um, going to be, clearly they're simple, right? And they are cuboidal. So this is a simple cuboidal epithelium. And then inside there, it's going to be secreting something, a hormone, right? Thyroid hormones. And that's going to get stored here as a precursor here in the endocrine gland, and then eventually end up in the blood vessel and out um, through the body for distribution. Whereas a exocrine gland is a secretory gland, basically, um, and something like a sweat gland. And again, we're going to have a single layer, so it's going to be considered simple, but this is more along the lines of squamous. You can see, and this might even be called, um, yeah, these are going to be squamous tissue. And this, in this case, it's actually going to be I apologize, these are secretory cells, correct. Um, and this is an exocrine gland where we're going to be secreting, um, in this case, sweat. Um, so the glandular epithelium can be either unicellular or multicellular. So unicellular would be comprised of single cells, multicellular obviously would be composed, comprised of many cells. Um, and some examples of the multicellular organs would be sweat glands, oil glands, salivary glands, etc. All right, so these are different ways in which we can secrete. So there are different types of the secretory ducts. They can be simple, which means that we only um, have the one major bulb or set of bulbs. So this is a simple tubular. This is a simple branched tubular. And what is the difference between that and the compound tubular is a question I get often. And the major difference is that we have one route of secretion. So this is basically one branch off that feeds into these three channels. This branches off and then branches off again. And so that's called compound because basically what you're looking at is how many branches of the sweat glands we have. So it's still going to be considered tubular, but it's a compound tubular versus a simple branched tubular because we only have one branch off here and this branches here into three. All right, we can also have a simple coiled tubular, and that's here is a too long tube that's coiled. And then we can have a simple acinar. What's the difference between an acinar and the tubular is basically the size of the, of the, the cells is going to change through an acinar. So it's going to be smaller and they get much larger towards the bulb region and then end up smaller again. Whereas if you see on a tubular, these are all going to be approximately the same cells. So acinar is going to be more of like a bulb and this is going to be more of like a long tube in the tubular. And just like the tubular, we can have a simple branched acinar as well. Again, we end up with branching, but we still only end up with one major access point. Basically, these rooms are all going to feed into the same foyer and then out through the same exit channel. Whereas um, with the compound acinar, which is shown here, Again, we have the bulbs that get larger towards the end and come back in, but we also have branches before we go into them. So that's called a compound acinar. And then if we have a combination of both of those, that's here, the compound tubular acinar, and that's just kind of an overview of the different types of glandular secretion you might be able to see. So let's talk about the function of the glandular epithelium. So we have three different ways in which glands can secrete things. We have mirocrine secretion, apocrine secretion, and holocrine secretion. Now, mirocrine secretion is something like the salivary glands, where we are going to create whatever it is and then have it secreted by way of these vesicles that then match with the plasma membrane and just 
by exocytosis secrete whatever it is into a solution. In this case, we'd be talking about something like amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down amylose, which is one of the sugars that gets digested very, very early on in digestion. We'll talk about that more when we get to the digestion chapter. Another example of secretion is apocrine secretion, depicted here from the mammary gland. Here in the mammary gland, the region of the cell that actually is needed to be secreted off is going to be kind of blebbed off or pinched off, and that whole portion of the cell is what's actually going to be the secretion itself. So apocrine secretion is going to result in large vessel vesicles that are going to basically be globular that are going to have biomolecules inside of them that are going to be exited off for, um, for secretion. And last but not least, we have holocrine secretion. Holocrine secretion is basically when the cell is going to sacrifice itself. It is, the cells are going to constantly be undergoing cell division. So cell division is constantly replacing lost cells. And as the cells that are divided grow up, then they're going to become mature and become their own secretory process, product. And that's an example of something like the oil gland or sebaceous gland in the skin is constantly going to be secreting not only oil, but also portions of the skin itself, of the skin cells itself. And that's the difference between mirocrine, apocrine, and holocrine secretion. So let's move on to connective tissue for just a moment. Connective tissue has two major elements. Um, the one is the cells themselves, and the other is the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix is basically going to be the glue that holds the cells together. Now, the cells don't actually have any sort of organizational patterns that you can really see. They don't cover or line anything. They don't have any free surfaces. You can't really depict which direction they are headed. Um, and... Uh, while epithelial tissue is going to be, I'm sorry, connective tissue, this is written wrong, this should say connective tissue right here, because epithelial tissue does not have vasculature, just to be clear. Connective tissue is highly vascularized and has a nerve supply. Um, the major exceptions for this would be tendon and cartilage, so they are um, going to be examples of connective tissue that are not highly vascularized or have a nerve supply. Again, this here should read connective tissue. We are not talking about epithelial tissue anymore. So let's talk about different types of of connective tissue cells. So first we have reticular fibers. Um, reticular fibers are made of collagen and multiple sets of glycoprotein and they are going to be responsible for the lining the blood vessel walls and forming all of the networks around smooth muscles and nervous tissue, etc. And so they look like here. These are the reticular fibers and you're often going to see them like kind of cutting through what appears to be just um, a randomly organized tissue. We also have fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are specialized type of cells Right, um, And these are going to be flat cells, very large cells. They move along the connective tissue, so you can see they're using the connective tissue as kind of a, a highway, and they're going to secrete fibers and substances. Um, we have collagen fibers, is what they were using, as I mentioned, as a, as a highway. Um, they're very strong and flexible. Um, it's the most abundant protein in the body, so collagen is found all over the entire body. Um, mast cells are abundant among blood cells. And these are very important because they're involved in the immune response. So they're going to help um, dilate the blood vessels, which is going to help join inflammation by killing bacteria. Um, so they also produce histamine, which you may have heard of an antihistamine. So histamine is part of the uh, allergic reaction. If something is an allergen, it's going to um, get attacked by your body. Um, sometimes that goes awry and you end up with what's called allergies. So you get, uh, you get a runny nose for literally no reason because some pollen or something gets in there. So you don't you have an increased immune response. But anyway, uh, the mast cells are going to produce that histamine, which your antihistamine that you're taking is going to help make these guys chill their role, essentially. Um, we also have these plasma cells here. Again, we'll talk about these when we get to the um, immune response. These guys develop from B lymphocytes, and they are going to be responsible for secreting different antibodies, and they're going to help neutralize foreign substances. So something like a bacteria or a virus comes in, and these guys have specialized antibodies that are going to get released either into the bloodstream or onto what's called macrophages, which are going to help be kind of like little soldiers that destroy the bad guys. Um, and these are, the antibodies are going to be specific for what's called an antigen, and that's going to be what's responsible for our immune response. Again, we'll talk about that more extensively when we get to the immunology section. This region here is um, ground substance, and it's basically going to be the material between all of the cells and all of the fibers made of multiple different types of extracellular matrix molecules, things like hyaluronic acid, glucosamine, um, and it's also responsible for supporting cells and fibers and binding them, and this is going to be basically like the, the square for the town to come meet, so we're going to have exchanges of substances between blood cells and um, the cells themselves. These guys are neutrophils. Neutrophils are white blood cells. They're going to be 
um, kind of cruising through the bloodstream until they reach a site of infection where they migrate out of the bloodstream, and then they're going to destroy whatever microbes are there by that process of phagocytosis that we talked about last lecture, where they um, have these little pseudopods that reach out and then engulf that microbe and then bring it on in where they're going to digest it. This is an eosinophil. Eosinophil is another type of white blood cells. Um, and white blood cells are responsible for the immune response, as I mentioned previously. So these eosinophils are specialized white blood cells that are going to mi uh, migrate to a site of infection, specifically a parasitic infection and um, anything that's going to be an allergic infection. So they're going to mitigate the allergic responses. These are adipocytes. They're shown as yellow, and you're going to see that fat is depicted as yellow and nervous tissue is depicted as yellow. But adipocytes are going to be fat cells, and their job is to store fat. They're found all over the body, but generally beneath the skin and around the different organs. These here are elastic fibers. They are going to be very stretchable. So they're just, that's why they're called elastic. They're made of elastin, which is a protein that's going to be a very flexible protein, and also fibrillin. And they are found in things like skin, blood vessels, and lung tissue, and they end up diminishing over time. So as we age, we end up with a loss of elasticity. Um, we end up making less elastin and less fibrin, so um, fibrillin. So our skin ends up ending up sagging, getting wrinkles, etc., and our lung tissue ends up with reduced capacity. Um, so that ends up happening as we get older. Here's another example of an immune cell. These are macrophages. Macrophages come from monocytes. It's a specialized type of uh, immune cell lineage. And they're responsible for destroying bacteria by phagocytosis. They also destroy any sort of cellular debris, cellular debris that they find. So they're just kind of cruising around cellular trash cans looking for bad guys that they can ingest or any sort of cell debris. And they do that by, again, phagocytosis, where they're basically cell eating. They're going to reach out their little pseudopods and grab in any foreign invaders and consume them. Okay, so we have this whole connective tissue extracellular matrix. So every time that we have these um, connective cells, we are going to have extracellular matrix around them that is basically the glue that's going to hold these, hold these connective cells together. And that's how, composed of two major things, the fibers and then the ground substance that we just talked about, all that extracellular matrix molecules like elastin and fibrin and um, hyaluronic acid, etc. So fibers are going to include things like collagen, uh, the elastin, which is the, the elastic fibers, the reticular fibers that we talked about first. So they're going to help provide strength and support, and then it's going to be filled in by all of that extracellular matrix molecules. Um, in an embryo, we have two different types of connective tissue, and I'm not really going to discuss embryology much. For, to me, I feel like that's an entire um, course in and of itself, but we are going to have the mesenchymal cells, or the mesenchyme, um, and then the mucous connective tissue. So basically, the mesenchyme is going to give rise to epithelial tissue, and the mucous tissue is going to give rise to the connective tissue. Um, Different types of connect connective tissue, we have loose and dense connective tissue, cartilage, bone, and blood, and each one of them are going to get their day in the spotlight as we go throughout this course. Let's talk about membranes for a second. So as we spoke, we talked about the plasma membrane previously, we, um, we talked about active transport and bringing things across it, but let's talk about membranes in terms of strength, right? Membranes are very strong. They're flat sheets of pliable tissue that are going to line one region of the body and keep it separate from a different region of the body. So we have two major types of membranes. One is the epithelial membranes, which is going to line our epithelial cells, things like mucous membranes, serous membranes, cutaneous membranes. Cutaneous just means skin, right? So subcutaneous would be under the skin. Um, and then synovial membranes, which are going to be part of joints. Um, so these are some examples of where you might find membranes. So here's a mucous membrane. And it, if you were, let me just orient you for a second, we're talking about the small intestines. And the small intestines have specialized cells called goblet cells. We'll talk about that when we get to digestion. But they're called goblet cells because they look like goblet cells, and they're also going to be responsible for secretion of things like mucus. And that mucus is going to go into the digestive tract and help uh, move everything along. Right? Underneath those cells, which are mucus-producing cells, we have what's called a mucus membrane which is here underneath that um, basement membrane. And then we also have what's called a serous membrane. Serous membrane um, would be inside something like serous fluid, which would be somewhere in like the example would be the lungs. Um, oftentimes you're going to see parietal and visceral. Parietal would mean towards the outside, visceral meaning towards the inside. So you'll see that for the plural. You'll also see that when we get to the hearts as well. So visceral and parietal are just orientation. Um, they basically describe direction for you.
Here's a cutaneous membrane. It's going to be an uh, example of the, like the skin, cutaneous. Here's the epidermis on top, the dermis underneath. You'll notice this is not a very straight barrier, right? It's going to be a very rigid barrier, and that's going to help keep that together. It's also going to allow it to stretch a little bit. So if you pulled, you could see that it would allow it to have some flexibility. Um, again, the epidermis is the top, the dermis is the bottom. Inside the dermis, we have all the vasculature, um, also the nervous tissue. This is a sweat gland. Um, and then this is all the blood vessels. Um, so the skin is going to be an example of a cutaneous membrane. And last but not least, we have the synovial membrane. As I mentioned, that would be part of like a joint, for example. And joints are made of two bones that are that come together, and that's called articulating. That means jo um, bones that are almost touching but not quite touching, but they're going to interact together. Um, and the synovial joint is going to connect those two, and that has fluid inside it. Basically, it's a cavity that contains fluid. And on the outside of that, we're going to have the synovial membrane, which is going to continuously secrete that synovial fluid into the joint. All right, so let's move on from connective tissue for a little bit and talk about muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is specialized because muscle tissue is going to be tissue that provides motion. And in the body specifically, skeletal muscle is going to help maintain posture by moving your bones. It's also going to help produce heat because it's going to use a lot of ATP, and so byproduct of that is going to be heat. Um, and the three major types of muscle tissue are going to be skeletal muscle, and we're going to have a several, well, an entire lecture on skeletal muscle, and you're going to have multiple different sets of skeletal muscles that you're going to have to go through and memorize for the purposes of this class. Um, we also have cardiac muscle, which, as you can imagine, is related directly to the heart. It's a very specialized type of muscle. Um, and then we also have smooth muscle, like, for example, uterine muscle or the muscle in the bladder. And each of those will get its own lecture. So we're going to move on for a moment to discuss nervous tissue. Um, in nervous tissue, we have two major types of cells, neurons and neuroglia. Um, neurons are going to be the major players. They're the ones that are going to be responsible for passing information from cell A to cell B. They have three major regions. One is the cell body, which is just like what any normal cell would have with all of the organelles and the nucleus. But it also has dendrites that are smaller and mul multiple, um, and axons that are, they have less of them and much longer, longer, and these are going to be ways by which they pass information from one nerve to the next, so one axon will interact with the dendrite of a different nerve um, or a different neuron, and that's, in this way they're able to pass information, sensory information, motor information, and allow us to perform all of the functions. Every time we move our arm, for example, neurons are firing to tell us to make a particular muscle um, either contract or relax. And neuroglia, if you can picture these guys, are like the nurse cells. Because neurons are so specialized, and we're going to see this a lot throughout the um, semester, there's a, several sets of cells that have such a specialized function that they truly aren't able to feed themselves and get rid of their cellular waste. They've gotten to the point where they are literally only able to do that specific function, and they need cells around them that are their nurse cells. And in this case, neuroglia are going to be the ones that are going to protect them and also support them. So these are their handmaiden kind of cells. Um, and then there are also multiple things that happen as tissues get old, um, injured. So tissues have to repair themselves every time that they get injured. And tissue repair is basically the process that replaces any cells that end up worn out or damaged or dead, obviously. And epithelial cells are constantly being replaced. And they do that by the division of stem cells. Now, we haven't talked about stem cells yet for this class, but we will talk about them a little bit later. Stem cells are specialized cells that are um, not only undifferentiated, but haven't um, but have the ability to turn into multiple different sets of, of cells. So they haven't yet been given their orders as to what their end path is going to be, and so they're able to become multiple different things. When I use the word differentiate, differentiate means become specialized. So previous to that, when they're undifferentiated, they don't have a specialty yet, and they have multiple different options of cell lineage. So stem cells are used to replace epithelial cells that are broken down or damaged. But not all cells are able to repair themselves. So connective tissue, for example, has a limited amount of ability to repair itself. Muscle cells, for example, can repair, but it takes much longer. So it takes a lot longer for a muscle injury to heal than, for example, a cut to your skin. And then there are some cells that simply cannot perform repairs. So, for example, some nervous cells, if you sever the spinal cord, you can't just put them next to each other and expect them to repair themselves, right? They simply are unable to function and they are unable to repair themselves as adult tissue. So some cells like nervous tissue, some nerves are in their final form and simply cannot be repaired. Now, if we end up with the repair of skin cells or, or a specialized type of cell that repairs very, very quickly, we end up with fibrosis. And fibrosis is basically any time that you have a, a scar tissue, you know what I'm talking about. It's thicker. Um, it doesn't have as much function, but it's very strong. 
And this can be a serious problem if you end up with fibrosis of, say, the heart tissue. Um, so fibrosis in the wrong location can end up with tissue that is um, minimally functional or not able to function at all. All right, and last but not least, we'll touch on aging. So as we get older, we lose the ability to absorb our nutrients properly. We end up with lesser blood supply to our tissues. We end up with an increased, um, with, sorry, with a decreased metabolic rate. So younger bodies appreciate, again, the ability to digest food very easily and get the nutrition out of it. So they end up with a, a increased metabolism. And yet as we age, we end up with the inability to do this. And it also is going to end up with a reduction in the ability of tissue repair along with these um, these issues as we grow. So that brings us to the end of this lecture, and I appreciate you listening to me. I will see you guys next time. Aloha and happy studying.